Okay. Okay. I hope so. <laughs> yep, it's recording. Hit it. Okay. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's evening here, late evening. Um, yeah, but we're really pleased to be with you. I'm Gadi Bassan, speaking to you from Kirat Bialik, Israel. Thank you for inviting me to your book club to speak about my novel. Full disclosure, right from the top, I have a lot more to say about the novel and its backstory than we have time for. So if there is something that interests you and either you want me to elaborate upon it or I don't relate to it at all, please make a note and bring it up in the Q&A session. Uh, first, I want to thank Rabbi Shaim for uh, uh, responding to me and um, putting me in touch with uh, Brenda so that we could set up this evening or this afternoon. And also, uh, I want to thank Brenda for uh, pointing out the sorts of things that interest you as a book club. And what she wrote was that you're interested in what inspired the book, what inspired me to write the book, my life here in Israel. Um, and how personal the book is. It's, it's the kind of book that uh, uh, brings that question up all the time. So uh, I've uh, decided to give the, uh, the talk a sober, um, uh, a sober title, uh, The Story of an Independent Yeah, yeah, the story of an independently published novel. Um, on the other hand, because it's not a great idea to take ourselves too seriously, I decided to give it three additional titles, three alternate titles. And they are The Trials and Tribulations of an Unknown Septuagenarian Author, The Adventures and Misadventures of an Unconnected Septuagenarian Author, and the life and times of a not widely known septuagenarian author. Um, okay. All right, I'm not a stranger to public speaking. I spent four decades teaching in schools and universities and classrooms with students ranging in age from three to elderly. I enjoy appearing in front of groups, but I am a bit nervous tonight your late afternoon, because this is my first Zoom appearance apart from in family gatherings. And as I said, I have a lot to say and not nearly enough time to tell the complete story I have to tell. I have spoken about my novel to groups in Toronto and in Israel over the years since my wife Donna and I first published it independently in 2013. I also wrote what I call the radio play, telling and acting out the story of the novel along with three other players in the highly regarded annual Meet the Author series here in Kiryat Bialik's Municipal Library. The radio play included musical interludes and was performed in Hebrew before a packed but intimate house of about 140 people in the library's auditorium. Among the other authors who were invited for that particular season was uh, Amos Oz, the late Amos Oz. It was a great honor meeting him. Here we are the renowned Amos Oz and me, the unknown unconnected Gadi Basin. And we are side by side on the poster announcing the season's offerings. And I must say he was very, very gracious. When he came, we attended and uh, found it, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a wonderful meeting with him. And here we are, my small troop performing. What you can see, it's, it's in it's Israel, of course, so I'm going to present us from right to left. On the right, that's me. And in the middle is Jeanette Rochstein Yudayan. She's the Persian Israeli vocalist uh, and a good friend. And Etan Lefoua on keyboards and sitar. And uh, below is uh, um, 
Moshe Gilad Golam, who uh, was the narrator. It was a great evening. I loved the opportunity to perform and tell my story, and we received rave reviews in the local paper. I was very proud of our performance. And I must say, I am just as proud to appear today, tonight, in this book club meeting uh, with you at Beth David. I want to begin with my credo as a storyteller. Everyone has a story, every one of us. Every man, woman, and child on this planet has an individual, unique, personal story. His own, her own, no one else's, replete with drama, dilemma, conflict, pain, hurt, hurting, intended or not, choices, changes of direction, planned or otherwise. All those elements of the stories we tell ourselves play roles in If We Could See Forever. The writing of the novel took years and reflected many years of experience. And then when I was done writing the novel, when I'd written the last word on the final page, the theme song of the novel wrote itself, both the music and the lyrics. The drama and dilemma, the pain and the hurt crystallized into a few verses. I don't know where the song came from. Call it inspiration, one of the wonderful experiences that, if you're lucky, accompany the creation of a work of art. I'll recite the first verses of the songs. It's called A Song for Annie, as you can see. And then play the audio of the second part of the song. Jeanette who is a very good friend and the same vocalist actress from the radio play recorded the song in a Haifa area studio. If you listen carefully, you will hear that I am, that I accompany her during parts of the song. Jeanette sings the part of Annie and she and Noam, our studio guy, thought it would be a good idea for me to sing Getty's part. The instant I fell in love with you, I knew we'd part. The instant I fell in love with you, I knew we'd break each other's hearts. For though our love was big, the meeting of two souls, and though you were my every dream come true, I knew you'd break my heart and I'd break yours the instant I fell in love with you. But we could not say no could not deny our love, and it grew as our time passed by. I began to think, just maybe, began to think somehow we'd find our way together after all. And, and. I wonder, do you ever think of me? Think of me the way I think of you? And I wonder, do I still mean to you what you have always meant to me? Since the instant I fell in love with you, the instant I fell in love with you. Thank you. 
Okay, music and lyrics by me. Uh, vocals, Jeanette Rothstein Udayan as Annie Yousefian, and uh, Gadi Barson as Geddy Mason. The arrangement and the instrumentals by Norm Zlatin, a very fine musician that we've worked with for years. This is uh, a photo sort of a blurred photo of uh, Getty and Annie from 1970. I have no problem admitting that Getty Mason is my fictional alter ego, even though the novel is fiction. More about that a bit later, but I must never reveal the name of the woman who is the model for Annie Yousefian. She is a woman of consequence in her profession in Iran. Her family is among the Iranian elite, and it could be dangerous for the regime to learn that she was in a relationship with an Israeli. So this photo is blurred, but you can see how young we were. So the story I tell is a boy meets girl story, but it's one with a twist. Annie and Getty come from very diverse backgrounds. They fall in love, so far so good, even a bit spicy. East meets West, a wealthy, upper-class, European-educated, Iranian Muslim family on one side, a patched together, grieving, middle-class Canadian Jewish family on the other. What usually follows in a typical boy meets girl and they fall in love story is that the young lovers enjoy at least a brief honeymoon of sorts, a time when all is right and the future is bright and shiny. Usually, complications set in only later. But no, we find out that Annie and Getty realize right away that they will part. Their entire time together is spent under a cloud. They know they won't share a future. And that creates tension and anxiety from the very beginning. Annie refuses to come to terms with their inevitable parting. Getty will not even allow himself to think about it. My novel is a story I told myself and thought about writing for four decades, from 1970 until 2008. Without ever making a serious effort to write it, even though I was encouraged to write it by the author Meyer Levin, a man I have long considered to be the most consequential American Jewish storyteller of the 20th century, especially if you look at his work recounting the story of the Jewish people in the North American diaspora, in Europe, and in Asia, both, and in, and in Israel, excuse me, both prior to statehood and since 1948. Levin did his storytelling in fiction, in nonfiction, in docudrama film, as a playwright, and in his commitment to personal activism on behalf of Jewish communities everywhere. I will speak briefly about him later. I suppose I was just too busy adjusting to life in Israel, raising our son and two daughters with my wife Donna, the two of us working multiple jobs in order to make a living. It seems there was no time to write the novel. And then I came to the understanding that I had a need to tell my story not only to myself as a self-narrative, but to others as well. I began to tell it to friends at social gatherings and they were all interested. They thought it was an unusual story. I began to think perhaps readers would also find it interesting that maybe my story would find its way to a wide readership. At the same time, I knew that that was unlikely. As an unknown, unconnected author, I had little chance to find a literary agent or a publishing house that would promote my story. But I also understood I couldn't not write my story. I had to write it even if it was for the sake of reaching just one solitary reader, just one. 
That was when I realized I needed to try to reach Annie so I could tell her that her prophecy had come true. When I did finally write the novel, it went through several incarnations. The first incarnation was what Donna labeled the list. Not good. And then I got to work, learning how to write a novel. Not easy. I discovered that writing a novel is many more times difficult than reading one and then studying literature. And I had high standards. I wanted to write the kind of novel that I enjoy reading. Again, not easy. Then I produced Annie and Getty. I printed a dozen copies and sent them to first readers for their evaluations. Among them was Marshall Cook, a creative writing professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I had developed a relationship with him during a brief but intense correspondence course. He gave me the green light. Until then, I was never sure of myself as a writer. Here is my response to his response to Annie and Getty. Wow, I anticipated that your comments to me would mean there is work to be done and what I will need to do feels a bit daunting right now, but I am certain it is necessary. I have always regarded Annie and Getty circa spring 2010 to be an off-Broadway production. So it was a great feeling reading your words. These were her, his words. I love this book, Getty. It's a treasure. I became captivated and you never let me go. Lots of guys can do sex, you can do love, and that's rare and precious. Marsh, I said to him in response, I read these sentences over and over. It was thrilling to me that you saw what I was doing and found my determination to reflect upon the inseparability of love and sex in this love story. Do you remember that when you sent me your response to the first 2,000 words of the novel, I wrote back and told you that after feeling very relieved and very gratified that you liked my beginning, around a half hour after reading your comments, I found myself weeping uncontrollably uncontrollably, yes, but for joy. Well, this time I was again relieved and gratified, but not quite so surprised. I have gained confidence in my writing since the summer of 2008. But then a half hour after receiving your email message, I found myself laughing out loud, trying to keep it down, Donna was sleeping. I would stop and then laugh again. This was almost as uncontrollable as the weeping had been, weeping had been the other time. I believe I was laughing in large part because I was feeling validated again and this time vindicated as well. Almost all the responses I have had from my first readers have been positive, but not all of them. Some of them just couldn't get past that Getty Mason was so much like the me that they knew that they couldn't experience the novel as novel, as fiction. Anyhow, since reading your critique, I have felt vindicated and at the same time ready and motivated to go to work on the revisions that I am sure will be challenging. There is much more in the exchange between Marsh and me. It's an important part of my adventure as an unknown, unconnected author. For me, the hero of our exchange is Marsh. He is both constructive and positive. I won't go over the parts of his critique that led to significant revision. It was most definitely a learning experience for me. What I do want to say is that the positive feedback he gave me provided me with the will and the feeling of momentum I needed to continue working on the novel. He led me to the understanding that I was worthy of the title writer. What a great teacher and generous man he is. Marshall Cook of Wisconsin. Among his comments, he said these things. Gotti, 
First of all, and most importantly, I love this book. It's brimming with life, love, conflict. And then he said, two overriding questions create the necessary tension. First, why did Annie and Getty part? And second, will they ever get back together again? Getty is thus on a double quest to figure out what went wrong and to gain closure on this great love of his young life. He's dealing with guilt and remorse as well as confusion. The time limit for finishing the master's thesis also increases the tension. I love your willingness to take chances as with the great early scene with Annie and Getty and the campus cop, wonderful. Love the de Tocqueville-esque observation about needing to understand baseball in order to understand America. You do some nice foreshadowing, creating a subtle sense that the relationship is doomed. The scene in which they ask each other, do you see yourself in my eyes, is especially tense. He also pointed out this about the ending. You leave the ending ambiguous. Beyond the hug and the mon chéri, will anything happen between Annie and Getty? I think it's fine that you do. I know what I hope happens and what I think will happen and have no problem at all if other readers hope and think differently. How about you? Our exchange about the ending continued in another set of emails. Marsh had an interesting take on the ending. He surprised me. He had one point of view as the reader he was and another perspective as my writing coach. I'm going to come back to this later when we discuss the ending. I want to discuss the ending with you in the Q&A part of this meeting. I want to hear what you think about the ending, if you feel it's a happy ending, if it's satisfying, but let's leave that for now, we'll come back to it. Some of us are conscious of the stories we tell ourselves. Some are very much so and others are less so, but all these stories we tell ourselves are self-narratives. How true are they? How factual are they? How does our super self-consciousness distort in our memories what has really taken place in our lives. I'm saying this in order to be wholly transparent, in order to account for the parts of the novel that blur the lines between my real life experiences and my fiction. I confess that in the novel I have written scenes that correspond on a one-to-one -one basis to events in my life or in the lives of people close to me. I'm saying this not to discourage questions probing to what degree the novel is autobiographical, but just to bring a realistic perspective into play. So what has happened? What has transpired in the writing when an author, in this case me, declares that the novel before you, the reader, is a hybrid, a novel autobiographically inspired? What product have you read? The product of my imagination, of my truth, of my incomplete truth, of what I wish has been true, of my struggle to understand the experience and the puzzle that form the foundation of my story. And what makes it art? What makes it a novel? What allows me to claim its fiction? I believe it's the shaping of the story. Remember, when I first tried to write my novel, the love story of my youth, my sharpest and best editor, my wife Donna, shook her head and said, this is a list, a list of everything that happened to you between you and Annie. After I got over the shock of Donna's candid and absolutely accurate appraisal, I understood I had to transform that list into a novel. Here are some questions, some issues I thought about. What is fiction? What is autobiography? How do they differ? How are they the same? Who can say that all fiction is invented, wholly imagined? Who can say that all autobiographical details are true, can be fact-checked and verified? All good fiction contains experience that includes significant conflict, either the author's own or that of someone else, someone who is either close to the author or whose story has influenced the author. That experience and that conflict first burrow deep into the author's psyche and then bubble up as they inspire the author. Then through thought, 
and hard work and revision, this inspiration evolves into the author's fictional narrative. The fiction can be as broad or as narrow as the author chooses. By contrast, all autobiography, here in my thinking I include memoir, all autobiography is necessarily selective, even when vigorously self-critical and revealing of the author's flawed nature. So it cannot be all-encompassing. It cannot be complete, and therefore, it cannot be completely true. The effort to make autobiography slash memoir artful, to fit it between a front cover and a back cover, between a beginning and an end, fictionalizes it. Now back to the novel itself. Once I had completed the writing and in keeping with the message that I wanted to send to Annie, the title of the first published version of the novel was changed from Annie and Getty to Annie's Prophecy. That was Donna's idea. Her point was that what I had written was more than just Annie and Getty's love story. It had become a story of an individual's sacrifice. Getty's sacrifice of a life with his beloved Annie for what he had always viewed as a moral imperative. It had evolved into a story in which historical currents and geopolitical revolutions alter personal lives. This is what the original published cover looked like. This cover not only foreshadows Annie's prophecy to be made explicit well into the novel, but it reflects lines from the very beginning of the novel when Getty is gazing northeastward out of his office window at the Lower Galilee College campus and thinking of Annie. It's 35 years since the last time he'd seen her. He looks past the nearby Mount Tabor and imagines he can see all the way to Annie's studio in Tehran. Here are the lines from the beginning of the book that the cover reflects. Each time he studies the, photo the photograph posted on the internet, her Islamic head covering first shocks and then hypnotizes him. She's still pretty, still intense and passionate. In the photo, the podium microphone angles up too high for her. She holds it with her left hand, adjusting it as she concentrates on her text below, squinting down through reading glasses set low on her nose. The sounds of melodious Farsi syllables play in his head and Getty sighs, thrilled by the well-remembered musical trill and timbre of his long ago lover's voice. Look at us again as we were in 1970. We were young and beautiful and in love and fully aware we would part. We were living in a mixture of profound euphoria and deep anguish. And despite our youth, we were already who we would be later on in our lives. Do you remember Annie's dream prophecy? We learn about it in this scene. Cuddling on the three-seater sofa a week after Getty's birthday, feeling the days and nights of their time together slipping away, Getty and Annie tried to comfort one another. Shh, mon amour, shh, Annie said. I had a dream. I want you to know my dream. She bit down on her lower lip struggling to hold back the tears welling up in her eyes. Tell me your dream, he whispered, his eyes filling with his own tears. I dreamed about us, about you and me, many years from now. Annie, Getty said, Annie, I, Annie shook her head and placed her fingertips on Getty's lips. In the dream, Cherie, it is 25, 30, maybe 35 years from now, I fly to Israel. 
I find you. Annie paused. She was sobbing now, big tears running down her cheeks. She smiled through her tears. Yes, Getty, I find you. He opened his mouth to speak. She hushed him once again. Shh, shh. Here it comes now. It's not yet there, I don't think. Hmm. Yeah? Here it okay, comes. okay. Here it comes now, Annie's very generous, very loving prophecy. You are married. Your wife, she is beautiful and brilliant. Une femme très, très belle et très, très intelligente. She is your Jewish wife. She is everything you want, everything you need in your woman. With her, you have Jewish children, Israeli children. You live in your own country. You wander no more. You are home. You are home. And here is one of the places where that blurry, fuzzy line merges, the real life self-narrative I play over in my head and the fiction, the novel that I wrote. To the best of my recollection, Annie said these exact words and look what my real life brought me. My beautiful, brilliant Jewish wife everything and more than Annie prophesied. My Jewish children, here where they are young, here where they are a little bit older. The Jordan River, Galil Elyon, our street in Kiryat Bialik, our own country, our own home, my home. Early reviews that appeared on Amazon were friendly, that is, from friends of mine, but they were also direct and to the point, making some very explicit worthwhile comments. In February 2013, my writing coach, mentor and friend, Marshall Cook, at that point, Professor Emeritus at University of Wisconsin-Madison, and also a prolific author of novels and nonfiction, and editor of Extra Innings, an online newsletter for writers, wrote this. Boston's dialogue is crisp and often funny. The interplay between Annie and Getty as they fall in love enchants, while their pain as they part is palpable. You wonder if they will ever get together again. If you have ever loved, you will love this tale of love and longing. In May that same year, 2013, an EFL colleague of mine Professor Linda Bruno of NYU, an English language literacy, literacy expert and New York City school superintendent said this, I can't remember the last time I cried at the end of a beautifully written love story. Boston's insights bring back my own college campus experiences in the 70s and provide a context for life in modern Israel where bomb shelters continue to be a reality. It should be a movie, a 21st century Casablanca. And in November, 2013, Ruth Wheeler Huberman, a fellow volunteer on Kibbutz Mayan Baruch from way back in 65, 66, wrote this. Gadi Basson has written a wonderful story through the eyes of a passionate young man. His passion is not only expressed in his love for a young Iranian student, but in his love for Israel and his need to be part of Israel's history. For the most part, those who read and reviewed the book, whether they were friends and colleagues of mine, or they just happened upon the novel, sent five-star reviews to the Amazon, Amazon site, or wrote to me personally, praising the novel. I can't be certain, but I think no more than 100 people read Annie's prophecy between February 2013 and March 2020. It's a common fate of independently published novels on Amazon. I know of authors who have had fewer than 10 readers and no reviews at all. Here and there, I made some half-hearted attempts to promote the novel. But as one marketing professional said to me, 
If you don't spend money on the promotion, you won't attract readers. Back in 2013, it was general knowledge that any company or agency that asked for money up front was to be avoided. But soon after that, companies specializing in marketing independently published books began to be legitimate. So yes, some were legitimate. But at the same time, more than a few charlatans were and are still trolling the internet for independent authors. They make all sorts of promises. You need to be careful. We fell for one guy, even though we had a meeting with him, with our lawyer's son present. We decided to try him. We put down a small sum and received a small service. Publication in his catalog, which he distributed at international book fairs he attended. Nothing came of that. We felt we'd been stung, even though the sum was not large. But all we could do was say, oh, well. So we did steer clear of all the hucksters for years. But during the summer of 2019, the itch returned. I wanted to give promotion of the novel another shot. I saw a Facebook ad by a company that said they knew how to make the best and most efficient use of Amazon.com. And they had the evidence to show they could do what they claimed they could do. Long story short, they did help. But ultimately, it became clear to me that their business had been designed to give authors an initial boost in the first days and weeks of a book launch. That wasn't my goal. I had hoped for a more lasting impact. I was being naive again. But what the company did for my novel did in fact yield 2,500 plus book orders in late May and early June 2020, plus tens of thousands of Kindle unlimited pages read through the summer of 2020. Most of the book orders were freebies or very inexpensive purchases. A few hundred purchases were full price, but they also provided more than that. Very high rankings in Amazon.com genres. And that brought with it bragging rights. I could say, just a moment. This is good stuff here. I could say that If We Could See Forever was the number one new release for a full month. We're talking about the number one new release in Middle Eastern literature. And I could show that my book outranked The Prophet I'm assuming several of you know about that book. And the book of Rumi, the Sufi poet, in paid orders. Paid, not free. And there were even a few days when my novel ranked number one in three genres at the same time. And the marketing company Boost in exposure provided still more. But wait a minute, before we go on, notice it's contemporary literature, literary fiction, Middle Eastern literature, and in Jewish literature. Pretty nice. Uh, so there were more reviews. Again, most of them were five star that praised the novel. Several reviews were so good they made me blush. Bloggers who have reviewed thousands of books said they were looking forward to more from me. One even said this. A debut novel that marks the introduction of a significant new voice in literature. Mark that down. Okay. So I guess I got my money's worth. Thousands of orders, tens of thousands of Kindle Unlimited pages read, great reviews, bragging rights about the number one rankings. But did you notice the cover of the novel wasn't the same as the current cover? I'm assuming the one that you read. That was the cover from May 2020. I did not want that cover, but the marketing wizards, the marketing wizards at the company insisted that it was the right way to go. I wanted a cover that would indicate that the story was about an Israeli and an Iranian and hint at the larger meaning of the story. The marketing wizard said, we need to appeal to the readers who want romance. I said, it's not a cheap romance. They said, trust us, 
we'll appeal to the women in Arkansas with curlers in their hair. By the way, they were also responsible for the change in the title of the book from Annie's Prophecy to If We Could See Forever. I gave in on that and also on the cover. So even though I got my money's worth with those number one rankings on Amazon and the great reviews, I wasn't at all sure that the thousands of orders represented thousands of readers. The Kindle Unlimited pages did represent readers, but I still found myself wondering if my true target audience had been reached and I had my doubts. I still wanted to target a readership that was interested in my Israel story, in the love story between an Israeli guy and an Iranian girl, in the history and the current life of those of us living here in the Middle East. So I decided, despite the marketing wizard's advice, go ahead and change the cover again. I don't know if that is having an impact on sales. It might be, but I do know it makes me feel that it more accurately depicts what the novel is about. Uh, flash, something that I just noticed today. I had the uh, most um, Kindle books purchased today uh, in over, I don't know, I think it's three, three months or something like that. So a lot of people are responding to the um, new campaign. When I say a lot, I mean a rel relatively a lot. Thus far, these were my adventures as an unknown, unconnected author, but now there is more. I've been posting on Facebook daily excerpts from If We Could See Forever and from two other books, a novel and a memoir. I've completed the second novel, but haven't published it yet. The memoir of my early life from birth to bar mitzvah is a work in progress. 83 people like my Gadi Basin author page and usually 10 to 20 people read my posts daily. Although there are days when far more engage with me and this is what I am seeking engagement. I know these are not large numbers, but it's a start and I enjoy the interaction when there are occasional comments. And together with the marketing wizards, I've embarked on another modest promotional campaign targeting people who are interested in Jewish historical fiction and Israel. It's anyone's guess <clears throat> if this campaign will have significant results. I have my doubts, but figure it's worth a try. <clears throat> this is the Facebook ad we are using. It has two very short blurbs and features the cover of the novel and a split screen background. The split screen background shows a famous mosque in Iran and the Western Wall Square area. The cover shows the two lovers, the Iranian girl's face and the colors of the Iranian flag, the Israeli guy's face adorned with the Star of David. In Hebrew and Farsi, the words, I love you, appear. Anu evotach in Hebrew and duset in Farsi. Despite the novel's greater exposure since the relaunch last May, I began to understand that what I really wanted, what I craved, was an exchange with readers. Feedback. That's when I decided to seek out book clubs that might be interested in my story and in the novel. And I turned to Beth David first as the extension of my Beth Am past. So here we are. Now, I want to relate to your interest in what inspired the novel. When does the love story begin? When does any story begin? When does an author begin to be influenced by events that will ultimately cause him to write a novel? I don't know, but I have been curious enough to give these questions some thought. Of course, I can't speak for any other storyteller, so 
but I have compiled an outline of dates and events that have influenced me, that have had a profound impact upon the genesis and the backstory of this novel. These are dates and events in my life and in Getty Mason's life too. And again, I must confess that it gets a bit fuzzy blurry where my life ends and my fictional alter ego's life begins. If we have time in the Q&A and if you want me to, to, I can expand on the following dates and events and people that inspired the writing of my novel. Here are more dates and events that influenced and inspired me. And of course, there are many more. In 1949-50, I was three, four years of age. My father took me aside and said, we have a Jewish state now after 2000 years of exile. We can hold our heads high. And then he made this declaration, all Jews must live in Israel. This was a pivotal moment in my life where he presented this message as an article of faith. I accepted his words with the same clear cut, absolute conviction as he stated them. He was my father, I trusted him and I adopted the belief that all Jews must live in Israel as something I knew I would follow through upon when I was grown. You don't have to believe me about the age three, four, but that's what happened. In 52, 53, I turned six and I began reading the newspaper from back to front. Apart from my father's declaration that all Jews must live in Israel, I was in charge of my own Jewish education. And for me, that meant reading everything about Israel that appeared in the Toronto Daily Star. I would look at the front page and then flip through the whole newspaper, skimming and scanning. Each time Israel appeared, I would stop and read the article. That was my source of news from Israel. Often, when an item about Israel appeared in the star, it was accompanied by a terse headline stating how many Israelis had been killed by Fedayin in an across the border raid. I was horrified felt wounded, hurt, took it to heart. I found myself mourning with the grieving families. At the time of the Scorpion Pass massacre, I was seven years old. In 1955-56, my formal Jewish education began with the founding of Beth Am at the farmhouse at 3100 Keel Street. My first teacher, Rabbi Katzberg, a bearded, yarmulke-wearing Orthodox Jewish survivor whose wife and children had perished in the death camps made a profound impression on me. I named Emanuel Katzberg the character in If We Could See Forever in his memory. In 1956-57 in public school, we did fifth grade current events. For 10 days in late October and early November 1956, the subject was usually the Sinai campaign. Only the teacher called it the invasion. That is that she took a, an editorial position and she called the Sinai campaign by Israel the invasion of the Sinai Peninsula. For several months after that, the main subject was the Suez Canal. My teacher, Miss Ruth Ori, never forgot her, a rather stern, formidable, and assertive presence in front of a class of 10 year olds, if there ever was one, spoke forcefully against Israel's invasion of the Sinai Peninsula. She said the invasion was aggression against Egypt, a sovereign state. I defended Israel, pointing out that the across the border raids had been encouraged by Egypt. And that was aggression against Israel that Israel could not tolerate. I said, based upon my reading 
of the newspaper that hundreds of Israeli citizens had been killed or injured in those raids. I also said Israel could no longer tolerate the blockade of the Straits of Tehran that prevented shipping from reaching the port of Eilat. The Suez crisis lasted most of the school year and I found myself debating my teacher for months. Not yet. Uh, something that, uh, that I want to add here is that um, more power to the teacher who gave me this, the uh, stage to speak against what it is that she was saying, but she never accepted my opinion. I don't know what the other children thought. I took the message of my Torah portion personally. On November 14th, 1959, that was the date, that was the Shabbat of my bar mitzvah, and it was Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha me'arzecha u'mimoladetcha u'mibet avicha el ha'aretz asher ar'eka. Go from your land, from the land where you were born, and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Lech Lecha. Well, I took the message personally. It jibed perfectly with my father's message. All Jews must live in Israel. That had been my belief as long as I could remember. Immediately after high school, I spent a volunteer year on Kibbutz Ma'ayan Baruch. The kibbutz is located on the Lebanese border east of Kiryat Shmona, not far from the foot of Mount Hermon. No border fences existed in those days. No landmines were on the border. You could just walk across the border. It was marked, but it was wide open. During the day, we could talk with the, um, uh, the Lebanese farmers, and we did. But at night, IDF soldiers would lie in ambush to protect us and other nearby kibbutzim and moshavim. Mayan Baruch was founded in March 1947 by youngsters from youth movements in pre-state Israel, and South Africa and the USA. Look at them. I recognize them. The blonde guy on the left, Moni, I, I don't remember his surname. He was from South Africa, was the boss of the cotton fields when I worked there. Those fields were within earshot of the Syrian army positions overlooking the Hula Valley. We often worked late at night. When we couldn't see them, we could only hear them. I believe in 1947, the founders, those 20 year olds or 18 year olds or slightly over 20, they were even more innocent and idealistic than I was when I spent my volunteer year on my Yan Baruch in 65, 66. Some of them were members of the Palmach. They were in their mid to late thirties when I knew them, still incredibly young, having achieved so much still a kibbutz in the traditional pioneering sense of kibbutz, children in the children's houses, children visiting the parents for four o'clock tea time, communal dining hall for all the meals, weekly meetings in the dining hall and Saturday night with lots of yelling and arguing, movies in the dining hall with clackety projectors and white sheets for screens, no popcorn, apples, oranges we peeled, the scent of citrus, people reading Hebrew subtitles and commenting raucously over the English language dialogue, laughing out loud when actors in Hollywood musicals broke out in song. In 1969-70, Professor Clayton Eichelberger introduced me to early American Jewish literature and to Abraham Kahn's fiction. As an undergraduate in Professor Eichelberger's American Lit class, I wrote a paper about Bernard Malamud's The Fixer, in which I said my grandfather could easily have experienced the same fate as Malamud's protagonist, Yaakov Bach, the fictional Mendel Bayless. That impressed Eichelberger, and he encouraged me to read and write a paper on Kahn's major work, The Rise of David Levinsky. Abraham Kahn was the editor of the Jewish Daily Forward, the Yiddish language Farvarts, for 50 years. 
I knew of him because both my grandfathers in Montreal and in Toronto read that newspaper every day. Kahn was a major player in teaching American and Canadian Jews how to integrate into life in the new world. I knew, I knew that, but I didn't know he had written English language fiction. Following here, following here, I decided to make Kahn's English language fiction the subject of my MA thesis. If you want to know where serious American Jewish writing began, read The Rise of David Levinsky. Of course, my relationship with Annie and especially our parting inspired my need to write the novel. As I said before, I wanted to write about us from the moment we parted. I suppose I had the subconscious need to commemorate our time together what I considered our extraordinary relationship and the exceptional young woman she was. Though I knew my decision caused us both emotional suffering, I always thought that my decision was for the best despite the pain it caused. Today, I am quite certain that my decision, what I did, worked out for the best, allowed both of us to become what we were destined to become, Annie, an important player in her professional life in Iran. Me, an Israeli everyman. Bottom line, it's clear what an inspiration to write Annie was. Clear who we were to and for each other. These words on the screen describe Getty's feelings about Annie when he was thinking about going to Ottawa. And they ac accurately describe how I felt for all those years before I wrote the novel and during the years while I was writing it. Passionate, romantic, charismatic, brilliant, talented, powerful, singular, a force field Getty was drawn to, pulled toward, gravity. And now, looking back, I, Gadi, and certainly add this word, inspiration. Well, not long after we separated, I made Aliyah. And I was in Israel for almost three years, 71 through 74. In the beginning, I found it much easier to go to Israel than to find myself becoming absorbed in Israel getting used to all of the customs and the way that uh, bureaucrats responded to Olin. I was a student in Jerusalem and a teacher in Galilee Lyon. And then I spent um, most of the last year in the IDF. Uh, that, was, that included the Yom Kippur War. When I got out of the army in the spring, of 1974, I returned to the USA to study for my doctorate. Meyer Levin's literary achievement became the official subject of my dissertation. But really, I delved into his life and writing and activism on behalf of Jews everywhere. He was active in journalism and literature for over 50 years. One of his great many novels was The Old Bunch, about his generation of first generation born American Jews in Chicago. Another, The Settlers, was about a family of pioneers in pre-state Israel. Both were based on personal experience and upon the experience of people he knew intimately. I felt a very strong bond between us, a connection between my experiences and his, even though those experiences were a generation apart. A bond between him and me and therefore an affinity that I had for his work. I believed I understood him, where he was coming from, what moved him. My father-in-law was an age peer of Le Levin's in Chicago. And like many of his contemporaries in the Chicago Jewish community, considered himself a member of Levin's old bunch 
And in my years in Israel in 65, 66, and in the early 70s, I had met and worked with people just like the characters that appeared in the settlers. I interviewed Levin three times, once in his home in Herzliya, another time in New York City, and the final time in the Evanston suburb of Chicago. We were in touch from 1977 until he passed away in 1981. Gadi? Yes. Hi, sorry. You know what, we're over an hour already. I, I was hoping that we would do some question and answer. Okay, I think, think we could. We absolutely can. Uh, and uh, just taking a look, I think it's just uh, another couple of minutes, right? I did read The Settlers. That was an excellent book. Yeah, another few minutes. Just another, another few minutes and then we'll cut to the Q&A, &A, okay? Okay. Uh, all right, so Levin wrote many books during his career and, and there's a list of many of them. Let's just flip to the list and so, so you can see it. Among the things that he did, uh, he was one of the first people to uh, be uh, uh, express an interest in um, the uh, plight of the Ethiopian Jews who wanted to come to Israel. Now, that, here's the list. You can you can see how much he he did. Is a is, he's a great story. Next, now we'll go to the next screen. Um, in our last interview, he confessed to me that he was tired and he was working on his final book. And he wouldn't write another one. I asked him, who do you think will carry on your work chronicling the story of Israel from the point of view of an American Jew? He pointed at me and said, why don't you do it? I thought he was being ironic that this was a verbal poke in the ribs. And maybe at the time it was, I don't know. In 1981, he was in New York going over proofs of his last novel. And I was in Haifa in an absorption center with Donna and her three-year-old son. He wrote to me after reading my dissertation, I had sent it to him after I received my degree, and he said something extraordinary to me. He said, you understood me as I have always wanted to be understood. I felt as if I had just been knighted and won a precious prize, had been given a gift I could never have imagined I would receive. In the same letter, He offered me the use of a one-room beach house where I could write in peace and quiet, and it was where he went when he needed to write undisturbed. He told me where to find the key. I was honored. I didn't make use of the place, but I did visit it on the 9th of July, 1981, um, and uh, I, I found the key in exactly the spot where he said it was going to be third rock from the from the door. I entered the house. I felt Levin's presence. I smelled him. It was very spooky. I thought he was in New York. Later that day, I found out he had been in the country for a few days to attend a conference in Jerusalem and that he had died of a stroke in the early morning hours of that same day. Um, yeah, this is, this, this is some very juicy stuff we're going to skip right now. Um, but he, he uh, just mentioned that he uh, created a docudrama, a, a film called The Illegals, in which he traveled with the refugees from Europe to uh, th through to try to break through the, the British blockade. And uh, it's uh, something that we see every Yom Ma'ud, every, every Holocaust day. And I imagine that you would recognize. I recommend you're going to the Spielberg archives and looking for the illegals. It's an hour film. Well, what else inspired me to write Annie's prophecy? I had written a letter to Annie and sent it to her via her brother in 1996. He lived in the USA. I had never received a reply. That was bugging me. I wanted to give it one more try to reach her. The second Lebanon war in 2006 struck me as providing the very final answer to the question, do we really want to be here? And the answer to that was, damn right we want to be here. Um, it 
we lost a close friend, um, Dave Lelchuk, who Mickey lit, lit back in the novel. It took a long time for me to get around to writing the novel, but finally the decision to uh, publish it when we publish it was because of upcoming valve replacement open heart surgery in February 2013. And I believe that I would survive and, th and, th and uh, thrive, but just in case I felt I needed to write another letter to Annie via her brother, Dr. Amir Yosefian. And I did that just prior to my surgery. So there's so much I wanted to describe to you. If we had more time, I would speak about the characters in the novel, my favorites, maybe I hear about your favorites. Uh, the scenes that derive from one to one real life copies of uh, real life experiences about the purely invented parts, about the parts that I'm not sure whether I experienced them or invented them. That kind of thing happens when it takes years to write a novel. And uh, we want to talk about the ending. So, I don't um, But before we get to the q and I do have a debt to Brenda. I wrote to her that we would have a surprise guest appearance. And when we spoke on a video call last Tuesday, she asked me if that surprise guest was going to be Annie. I declined to respond. Had I responded, I would have said yes and no. No, Annie is not one of my invited guests as an online participant in this Zoom call. But on the other hand, on the other hand, Technical difficulty here. Now. Hello, everyone. This is Annie speaking to you from Tehran. Thank you all for attending Gary's talk. I hope you have enjoyed his comments on the novel and also hearing about how Gary and I have reconnected since he and Donna published Annie's Prophecy. Our reconnecting has been very special and very meaningful. Why? our family. It is always so refreshing to be in touch with people whom we befriended in youth. We keep seeing ourselves at that young age again and it makes us feel so much younger. I just want to say that I was so surprised that after 36 years Gary still remembered so many details of our conversation. But most of all, I want to say that Annie's portrayal is an idealized version of me. And I was so flattered when I read it. But then the line between fiction and reality is so blurry, as he himself said it. I also want to encourage those of you who haven't read Annie's prophecy to read the novel. It is Gary's equivalent of Tolstoy's War and Peace. I think this novel would make a great movie. It is amazing how he goes back and forth in time and space between 1970 and 2006, between the US, Canada, and Israel. Some details are fictional. The gist of the novel feels quite real. And I think he has captured the essence of love and war. All the best to all of you. Brenda, does that qualify? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I want. I want to. Uh, there, there's there are a couple I of. Thought, very, I thought you were going to introduce you know, Carol. Pardon. <laughs> I thought you were going to introduce Carol. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, that's that's uh, novel number three. Uh, <laughs> stick your head in, Donna. Here's yeah. Donna. I'm the technical person here. <laughs> um, it's good to see you again. So uh, uh, Annie did read the novel, but before that happened, one morning about it. Uh, uh, um, a month, I think it was, after my uh, surgery. And it was, can, 
And it was 42 years almost to the, or to the week since the last time we said goodbye. My inbox included an email message that began, Dear Gary, thank you for this wonderful book. We always knew you were a writer. Hope your heart operation went well. I did get your previous letter, but I was devastated at the time by my separation from my husband of 25 years. I am now quite well and have two beautiful children and I'm busy working. I'm just coming back from the US where I was invited for a month on an international visitors program. It was great. Hoping to read the book soon, I read a review which said would make a great movie. Take care and stay in touch. I responded right away. I'll give you a taste of it, just the first and the last line. Uh, this note from you has, is long awaited and most, most welcome. And I asked you if we could write and communicate freely because there are limitations when you are in touch with someone in Iran. And, um, and I uh, commented on how uh, wonderful it was that she was honored with her participation in the program in the US. Just more testimony to her outstanding career. Then she did read the novel and this is what she said very briefly again. I read your book in two nights, but if I didn't have to go to work, I would have finished it in one sitting. And she signed off, big hug and greetings to your wife who is an extraordinary woman. Um, are, we, are we there now? Yeah. Okay, so I think we, I have more, I have encores and whatever you'd want, but let's, I, I really do want to hear what you have to say about the ending and anything else about the novel that uh, you'd like to bring up. So I'm going to take everybody off of mute and okay. let's figure out how to unmute everybody. Um, 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 hmm. Oh, ah, no. Someone wrote, to... any reason why you didn't introduce the religious differences between Getty and Annie as part of the story. Well, um, it, uh, can I see a hand so I know who asked that question? Okay. Um, uh, well, in, in, in fact, I, I didn't believe that one of the things that I would have gone on to is the, when they first met and they went out for steak and there was a bacon uh, garnishing on, uh, on the steak and she just kind of pulled it off and hid it in a in a napkin and then ate the steak. Now, um, that's kind of the level of my religion also. Um, it's not something, it's, it's, it's more tradition than, than belief. And uh, so in other words, we basically shared the same uh, degree of religion and it was not a problem for us. Uh, we never made it a problem for our families. Uh, that was the real life. And I thought that that fit perfectly in the novel. Yeah. Are there other questions? If, if there aren't, I'll go to some of the juicy parts. Oh, they don't have, they, there's no questions there? I, I can't see. see if there are any. I've, I have let anybody who wants to go off of mute to please do. And then you can ask some questions out loud as well. Okay. One of, should I ask my, I've asked you so many questions. Everyone's already. shy. <laughs> okay, Francis. Oh. She's muted. Francis is muted. Francis, take off the mute. And that's my dog. Okay. Is there anyone else who can come back to you when you fit? Figure it out. Wait, I think you're on. You're on. You're okay now. It said the host has muted me. I tried to unmute myself. I wanted to ask you about the support that Annie and Getty had from both their families in the novel, because I read that and I thought, like, how realistic is that? And I don't know how much of it was based on reality or if that was like an idealized version of what you would hope, you know, in an ideal world. That. Um. Well, I, I don't I don't regard it as if, if we're talking about what really happened and and uh, 
had an impact upon what I put in the novel. Um, we did not have uh, objections from, um, from the families, except in, in, in well, certain ways. One, uh, she had a brother who I did not introduce into the novel, who clearly did not like me and had nothing to do with me. It had to do with, I, it had to do with our differences in background. Uh, but he doesn't like anyone and still doesn't like anyone to this day. So uh, I, I don't take it personally. Um, he's not even close with the rest of the family. On the other hand, her brother, uh, Amir, I can't, can't give his name either, but Amir is a, is a total gentleman, a very wise man, uh, also high up in his profession. Um, and on my side, uh, my sister was very welcoming because I don't know, she, that's who she was. But I had an aunt who was staying with my sister at the time when we were visiting. And uh, she had a kind of a, she was a very sweet lady and everybody loved her and she was the matriarch of the family. But she called uh, Annie uh, Gary's Arab. And of course, she's not even an Arab. <laughs> so, so there, there, there was, there was a, there was plenty of uh, realism in 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 our life, and uh, um, it was. But it wasn't. It was not. Uh, it, it wasn't an issue. It, it just wasn't an issue. We we were wrapped up in each other, and we knew we weren't going to be together. So. It 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 just didn't become an issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, until I'm, I, I would love to. I I can uh, conclude with something uh, that I think uh, would be a nice recollection uh, as a conclusion, or throw out a couple of points uh, before that. You, you asked about how personal the the novel is. Um, uh, you can give it to me from the pages. No, I actually I just sent a question, but I sent it to, to uh, Donna. Um, oh. <laughs> the friends that you, <laughs> I just send it to the world. Um, the friends that you mentioned, the one here, Lisa in Toronto, of course, and um, the ones at university. You said that you maintained; they were good, close friends. Um, my question is: Are they real, even if their names names have been changed? Well, um, again, what, what makes it fiction is the shaping. And, uh, and it, it, I, I, I can't say that I remembered every single, um, uh, every, uh, uh, every, every comment that was made, every, uh, not every conversation is a conversation that happened, but um, these were, the, most of the characters were based on people that I knew or people or composites, as they always say. Um, so these, yeah, I had real, I had very good friends, people who were concerned for me when I was uh, uh, in a, really a state of mourning and uh, did their best to take care of me, um, to look out for me. So yeah, they're they were real good people. Sasha was wonderful. Um, uh, Lisa was wonderful. Fernando was wonderful. Um, these are all people, I, I could actually give their names, but I would have to get permission from them uh, about that. How and, often do you see them? Now? Um, rarely, but, but we have been in touch over the years. It's been 50 years since uh, since I lived in Dallas, so um, but we're in touch. Uh, the um, uh, the internet makes that easy. So, yeah. What question did you send to Donna? That was the question. I decided to just spew it out. Okay. <laughs> and Donna knows about everybody. 
<laughs> She's a saint. Yeah, that's what you said before. <laughs> I know, and I still mean it. <laughs> I, I, I would like, to, if there are no more questions, I'd like to, what, what, what? I'd like to, oh, oh, there's nothing on those pages. Are they on here? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, just briefly, uh, scenes that actually did happen and found their way into the novel. Um, from 1970-71, there's the scene with uh, Getty chasing after Annie the first time he sees her from the window. That happened. There's the, I mentioned already, the peeling of the bacon strip off the steak. Uh, uh, something else, I don't know how many of you um, noticed this, but uh, Annie s pronounces clothes, clothes, and Getty loves that. Judy, you, you remember? Judy Silver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And then there is this broken right side mirror on Sasha's car when he goes to Bloomington and they have, uh, he, he tries to to, to explain to her what going on or just to make it up somehow for the way he left. And um, there was a real broken side mirror. And when I was driving out of, uh, when I was driving past her on the street, I looked into the mirror to get one last glimpse of her and saw that the mirror was broken, remembered that it was broken at that point. And something like that cannot happen in real life, in an author's life, and not go into, into the fiction. It's it just too dramatic and too symbolic. And then, of course, there's the fun of the campus cop who caught us in the uh, uh, office uh, building. In 2006, I loved the, the, the concert at the Moshav uh, uh, after the war. Uh, where um, uh, Getty and Carol um, uh, have gone for sort of R and R, but they see a young couple that reminds them of the two of them. The mother, the young mother, is is uh, breastfeeding the, the the baby. We also do something like this. We go to the. <laughs> okay, I, we. I'll get to that in a second. We just saw a question. Um, we go to the beach to walk, and there are dancers there. And we've uh, uh, we say things like, uh, "Well, what a warlike people!" Because people, some people in some places, talk about Israelis like that, and and we're not. And uh, the same thought occurred to us when we were kayaking on the Jordan River and watching the people floating by. The question that just came in now was the multicolored car real? Yeah, it was. And I don't know where the uh, if where a, a photo of it is, but the major thing that there was about it was that um, uh, on our trip, long trip that we took from uh, 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 the U.S. to Canada and 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 back. Um, uh, through Washington, whatever I told uh, in the in the novel, um, Brenda wants me to reread the novel. So, but, um, the the, uh, uh, the what we got was uh, two kinds of finger signs, and, and we're all adults here. So one sign was this one, okay, and the other sign was this one. And everybody made up their minds in advance who we were, the people who were driving the car, and especially who I was. It was my car. And uh, so I was very glad to repaint it um, uh, some months later after I'd uh, returned to Toronto. And um, what else was invented? Uh, gazing out the window and imagining seeing Annie in her studio in Tehran, that was just create a kind of symmetry between the first time he saw her and, and thinking about her uh, prior to considering the possibility of going to see her in Ottawa. And uh, Emmanuel Katzberg's story and his wisdom, it's all invented. 
On the other hand, I have known a lot of people like him. I, I, I grew up with Holocaust survivors' children and, their, and the, my friend's parents. Um, the unmailed letters to Annie prior to going to Ottawa, they were all made up, never, nothing like that ever happened. And the ending in Ottawa was, uh, in Ottawa was also uh, invented. Um, I like the symmetry in, in, that, in that about the gazing out the window. Um, and the other thing that uh, I, I, I did there, you, maybe you notice that both Getty and um, uh, Annie have uh, friends of the opposite sex who were with them at that point when they have their rendezvous in Ottawa. And these are people who had been lifelong friends of theirs. Reza, who is uh, Annie's lifelong friend, did not take advantage of her when he could have. And really the same thing is true about Lisa. When Getty was really down and said, you know, maybe we'll get married. She said, you don't really want to do that, do you? And so that also uh, happened. Now I'm, I'm going to conclude unless there are more questions, with uh, a scene that I hope you can uh, uh, relate to. Donna, can, if you want to I want, see uh, Yeah, I'd like, I'd like you to see, I'd like you to read along with me. So you can see this, this screen. Um, this is from the beginning of the book or close to the beginning of the book. Um, I just need a little bit more, yeah. And it's, it's the bacon scene. Uh, they drove to the Sizzler Steakhouse on West Main Street and ordered salad and steak and fries and soft drinks. Annie's steak came with a strip of bacon as garnishing. She used her fork to pick the bacon steak off the steak, the bacon strip off the steak, wrapped it in a napkin and deposited it under the edge of her plate. Then she wiped the fork clean with another napkin. I am not a practicing Muslim, but in my family, we don't eat pork products, she said in explanation. Neither do I, Getty said. For me, it's more tradition than belief. Annie nodded. Yes, that is how I feel. You are Canadian, she said. Uh-huh. So what are you doing here in Indiana? It's a long story. You do not want to tell me? I do want to tell you, he said. I have a feeling I want to tell you everything. He didn't know what made him say this. Perhaps it was the tingling and shivering he'd never experienced before. Or maybe it was the inspired impulse that had moved him to run after her the first time he saw her. He'd been in love before, but this was different. He chased after her when he had no idea who she was. He wondered about her for weeks and despaired of ever seeing her again. Then in the library, she appeared as if out of nowhere and spoke to him. She came to him, knew his name, and now, on a day that had begun like any other day, he was sitting with her in the Sizzler Steakhouse on West Main Street, and something amazing and wonderful was happening. Annie was silent, but her dark eyes said, then tell me, tell me everything. I want to know everything about you. Looking into her eyes, Getty laughed at himself. Here you are, like every fool in the history of love, telling yourself this is different. But you know almost nothing about her. She's an Iranian from a Muslim family. She's 17 years old and you're Jewish and 23. This can never work. Let it go. Don't tell her everything. Just don't. It will lead to complications, impossibilities, heartache, but reckless and impulsive and wild and burning with the fire of unchecked passions. He did tell her everything. The rest is history. <laughs> I, did, I didn't write, and the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we are in touch. We are very close. We're best friends. The one thing that we haven't managed to do is to arrange a, a rendezvous. Each time something like that seems to be in the, in the offing, somebody is ill. Uh, and uh, right now, we are not going anywhere because of the COVID. Uh, but we write uh, several times a week. And as I said, we're in each other's lives. Uh, Donna, the, who you call the saint, is a very good friend. 
they can have laughs at my expense. And uh, it's, uh, it's been uh, one of those amazing experiences that you cannot ever expect, but it happened. And uh, I wanted to tell the story. I hope you enjoyed it. Did you enjoy it? I did. I did very, very much. And we've already said that we've no. spoken. Um, I'm going to say goodbye now because we were only having this until six and it's 612. I want to say one more thing. Say it. Those of you who are uh, in other book clubs, if you could encourage uh, the leaders of other book clubs to uh, give, uh, read, have their people read uh, the book, and I'll be very happy to give another session. I'd, I'd love it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I enjoyed this very much. I enjoyed our conversation on Tuesday. And oh, that's my dog. Um, and I want to thank you very, very much. I guess my dog does too. And uh, uh, <laughs> she's not very polite. She has no manners. I trained her well. Um, and uh, I hope to I hope to speak to you again. I, I am taping this. I don't know what to do. I click it to the cloud, and God knows where which cloud it is on. So, <laughs> but uh, again, thank you from all of us for joining our book club. I told you we were uh, small but mighty. Mighty, yes. Mighty, and that's who we are. Um, and um, good night. We'll speak okay. to you again. At, at, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. And, and please uh, give my regards to Rabbi Shine. I will, I will. Good night. Bye.